Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations for the Future. I'm Lee Steinke with Foundation for the Future. Today is day two of our discussion about space garbage, recycling, and sustainability. We're going to kick it off right away with an interview between Tim Chrisman and Representative Matt Bainke. Tim is Executive Director and Co-Founder of Foundation for the Future. A former CIA and Army Intelligence Officer, Tim supported the National Space Council and the Joint Staff at the Pentagon. He holds Master's Degrees in Intelligence Studies and International Relations and Affairs, both from American University. Mr. Chrisman is the author of the book Humanity in Space and of various articles about the expanse of our civilization in space. Tim's next challenge and mission is to make space accessible, survivable, and ultimately routine enough to be boring. Representative Matt Bainke is serving his second term representing the 8th Legislative District, which includes Richland, West Richland, and Kennewick. Matt then attended Eastern Washington University, where he graduated as an ROTC Distinguished Military Graduate and received his active duty commission in the U.S. Army Aviation Branch in 1990. He spent the next 21 years in the service, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel before retiring and moving back home. Since 2015, Matt has served as the director and lead professor of the Cybersecurity Division at Columbia Basin College. He also owns a cybersecurity consulting business. Before joining the legislature, he served for three years on the Kennewick City Council. In the House, Matt is serving on three committees, including in the leadership role as the ranking minority member of the Community and Economic Development Committee. He is also a member of the House Appropriations and Environment and Energy Committees. Matt, uh, Tim and Matt, have fun with your conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Lee. <clears throat> yeah, good to have you here, uh, Representative Benke. Uh, I know we've uh, had you on before, and it's exciting to bring you back in uh, to the conversation, uh, especially since one of the committees you sit on is very applicable to what we're talking about today around sustainability in space and sort of getting things right and not having to go back and fix things like we're doing here on the ground. And thank you for having me this morning. I've only had a, one cup of coffee, so I'll try to hang up there with you, Tim. Uh, I'm honored to be with you guys again. Had an incredible time and really excited to be with you to talk about. I like what she was mentioning during your intro. Let's make space routine enough to be boring because that's what we're kind of doing at the state. We're trying to incentivize to locate and showcase what we're already doing in the space industry and how we can work on manufacturer training the workforce of the future and how we can work into that uh, innovative and research space that we're already seeing. So we could talk a lot about that this morning. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear more because, you know, most of the people sort of inside and outside the space community kind of see Washington State as one of the core pieces of the space community. You know, there's Florida, Texas, California, and Washington, and that's sort of the idea. And so, uh, the fact that Washington is continuing to up the ante, so to speak, push the envelope to find new and better ways to engage uh, this sector and expand what they're doing um, isn't necessarily something that would be readily known. We would all just assume you've got it figured out. That's exactly right. And, and part of my job, I feel like we could take that leadership role again in the nation. We have a lot of the infrastructure. We have a place where if you look at history, there's a reason Silicon Valley blew up with Apple and the, the way the Silicon Valley of today is. And looking back to where that core fundamentals are, having a great base, having a smart base. We have the largest per capita PhD in the nation, working with the uh, national laboratories, working in this different industries and even the manufacturing sector, that this is another opportunity where we can see, take advantage of it at the time, I believe, before we lose this uh, gap in space, because I believe we're not going to be there uh, very far to where we're going to see this on a routine basis. People are going to know we're going to have the opportunity to go to space. We see this with the Space Race 2.0 I talk about. Uh, I ran a bill to try to increase that priority in the state of Washington to see that we can leverage what we have in our communities and showcase what we do in those space industries. Yeah, it's uh, it's you know, 
good to be constantly reminded that, you know, when you're, uh, you know, at the front of the pack, you don't stay there just based on momentum. And you know, as the space industry is sort of in this state of flux, moving from government specific uh, to a primarily commercial market, uh, you know, it's exciting to hear leaders on the ground like you talking about that uh, and talking, you know, practical ways of making this normal. Um, you know, I talked with the Pacific Northwest Aerospace uh, Association you know, that emerged from Boeing supply chain. And the vast majority of those members are not people that you would know. They're those background routine people that make the widgets that go into every plane virtually we fly on. And that's the sort of thing that it sounds like you're talking about, whether it's from the workforce to the you know, nozzles on a rocket. It sure is. And one of the exciting parts of showcasing what we have in our local community in southeastern Washington, in farm country, ag country, uh, we have one of the ladies who's part of the Artemis program and uh, astronaut Kayla Barron, one of the women who are leading this effort, uh, went to the Naval Academy, uh, did excellent through there. And we're excited uh, about a homegrown product that she's leading the industry right there herself working through the NASA program, working through the Navy Academy and her hard work and dedication is showing that passion, that drive. And really uh, you mentioned the opportunity to diversify and reach out to individuals now that says, hey, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. And it's that basic fundamentals of we're Americans. We can go after this and we can be number one again and we can lead from the front. Let's not be complacent and sit back on our laurels and let's showcase some of the great technology, the innovation we have, and then train that workforce of the future and showcase women who are leading these efforts. Yeah. And, you know, if, an, you know, even a Naval Academy grad can do it, so can you. you know, exactly you right. Coming from the yeah. Army. I mean, yeah, exactly. you know, I got to give a little bit of hard time for being the Navy, but, you know. <laughs> um, no, and you make a good point because as we've seen over the past year or two with Space Force standing up, there was a lot of excitement around this idea that, oh, good, everything NASA's not doing, Space Force can take on. You know, we're both uh, prior Army, and I like to tell people, like, look, the Army's really good at doing what it's told. It'll paint rocks until there's no more rocks, but... <laughs> It's not going to be the best job done if it's outside its core competencies. And, you know, what's it like being, you know, a, a retired army officer advocating for a lot of these commercial things in that era where Space Force is getting a lot of hype? Well, and you said it right there. I think the key is the army knows what it's great at. Everybody knows the strengths of what we can do in the military in each of the sectors. And to the credit, each one of the military branches has their specialty. And we should focus on that to innovate and drive. But there's only certain things they can do. And there's limitations where the commercial, the civilian element needs to jump in there and innovate. And we see that with Elon Musk, with Bezos, and some of these innovators that are showcasing this. And I believe we're at that cusp of history. We're going to look back and go, this is an amazing time that we're in. Let's take advantage of that and move that even forward. It's showcasing excitement, the passion. People are starting to follow these different areas. I don't know how many people were on the YouTube calls and even on your, your podcast following you as well. I'm sure have increased because it is getting to the normal of, hey, there's another rocket that's taken off this week. And it's just kind of the standard. And I hope it continues. I, I think it will. I think it's going to get to the point to where it's like Uber in space, to where you can pick up, you can check your app. You can find out where you can go to the local spaceport and then take off. And we're going to have issues. And I think not very long from now, talk about space traffic and, and air traffic and how do we control different things. We're going to look at manufacturing jobs that are going to be created in, in spaces that were probably more normally normal ag or committees of uh, places around our state that or nation that normally communities wouldn't pop up because of some of this other infrastructure. And even in our neck of the book, looking at the innovation of hydrogen, nuclear, solar energy that are gonna come out of this. And, and that's what's exciting about it for me. Oh yeah, no, and um, I think you're, you know, you're right on about how much potential there is here. In many ways, it feels very similar to the late 40s, early 50s with commercial aviation, where the military's been the ones doing this, you know, big, fancy, expensive programs. And now there's, 
you know, more demand for the rest of us. And Washington State's been a centerpiece of commercial aviation uh, since the beginning. I mean, you know, a number of bomber factories were there during World War II. Um, what lessons are you all in the legislature taking from that transition from military to civilian uh, air travel and applying to the space world? Well, a lot of it is uh, breaking down barriers. And one of the reasons you asked me earlier why I came to the state legislature is I see too many of the, the red tape we saw when I was stationed at the Pentagon or other places overseas that sometimes, frankly, the government gets in the way. Uh, we got to get government out of the way and showcase some of this to where we can smooth the path for that innovation, that maintenance, that manufacturing sector to grow and really expand. And I believe uh, incentivize some of these areas to get that competitive nature going again. Uh, mm -hmm. We always are at our best when we're trying to compete. And whether it's, you know, the Seahawks, which are going to win this uh, Super Bowl again this year, by the way, um, or the Patriots, you know, when they're going up against each other, you're rooting for your home team. We're rooting for America. And I think what a, what a better way to bring Americans back together over a last year of COVID that's driven a lot of people apart, frankly, on the political spectrum in our neighborhoods. You bring people together, galvanize them toward a single common vision, a goal to bring back America to be number one again, this is a great opportunity to do that as well. No, I completely agree. And I mean, when we look back across U.S. history, we see time and again, when the, we start to get comfortable as a people, we start agitating and, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop, you know, whether it's the whiskey revolts uh, from the 1700s, we need that frontier and that challenge and space offers that. Um, and it's exciting to be part of, of what's happening there. It is. And I, I can't thank you enough again to opportunities like you guys have today. Uh, when we met and just the excitement I had and the passion and kind of being together, I feel I'm just one piece of that big puzzle, if you will, the cog to keep driving this whole industry moving forward to showcase what we can do in the state of Washington to drive it in our committees, to have the hearings that we need to have to build that base to where individuals can come like yourself, the experts can bring that to other legislators and then advocate with the stakeholders to develop the right policies we need to have and develop those not only in the state of Washington, but also nationwide. So then it's one standard throughout the nation. If you set up a space force here in the Tri-Cities, which we'll have one soon, probably one of the first ones to make sure that that's the same standard that's going on in Omaha, Nebraska, or, you know, Kentucky, or you name it. And we yeah. want to standardize that to, with the number of launches and how we control that in the different areas we can within that industry. Yeah, no, and uh, we were talking with Wayne Monteith from the FAA yesterday about spaceports and the licensing and um, that process that they go through. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we don't necessarily think about when they're launching an investigation or doing some of these evaluations, um, if you're on an airplane or at an airport and, you know, the engine isn't working right or the terminal doesn't match up with the airplane you're getting on like you want someone checking on that <laughs> so yeah you yeah. don't want a 50 state network of patchwork rules <laughs> no and um, you don't want them to sit there and flip through some manual or something on their iphone and going hey which one oh i'm in washington state it's different from idaho and yeah, yeah. we want a standard to go across the board just like you said, with an FAA regulatory function, safety first, like anything, but have that out there. And I tell you, one of the things we're already looking at is, is focusing on permitting of land. So we mm. can already look to the future. One of the biggest hurdles always is, where do we put it? Where's the land that we can see and be working with the local community members, local community elected leaders, and the advocates to make sure that everybody knows this is the plan for strategically to locate here and drive that economic development. And I think that's one of the big keys as well. Yeah, no, and one thing we've looked a lot at is how can we take, you know, learn from what you know, people like you and others who have done these things, how can we institutionalize that nationwide? Um, have other state legislatures or local governments reached out to you all in Washington to say, look, how do we do this? I have. I've received a number of phone calls. Frankly, I didn't know I had this many friends. Uh, and maybe they were getting mad at me because I keep rooting the Seahawks on for the Super Bowl. I don't know. One of those things. Or, you know, being a helicopter pilot all these years and jumping out of airplanes. It's one yeah. of those weird things we always connect. But uh, no, I, I think it's 
they're starting to see that as well as an opportunity. They're hearing the news. They uh, frankly see what you guys and your hard work that you're doing in this uh, foundation and continuing to push this at the Congress, uh, into the halls of Congress, into the different areas that we see each other at, you know, walk in the hallways and the virtual, you know, Zoom meetings and things across this, but hopefully soon in person, uh, that people are starting to get excited. They're starting to see, hey, Washington's doing this. we got to keep an eye on what's going on. And, and frankly, that's driving a lot of the things that we're doing. And people go, hey, I, I think you got something here. Let's look at this. Let's look at the details. Let's showcase how we can diversify and, you know, and show equity in our state and show that we are leaders and bringing people together. Yeah. And people are excited when I talk about them. Yeah, no, and it's, it's, it's fascinating because in a lot of areas of economic life, there's this sense that I need to keep this close. I need to hide the right. details. I need to protect myself. Um, but here, it, there, there very much seems to be, oh, I tried that. It's not going to work. Try this instead. Or here, you know, let's work together on this. And that's refreshing. I mean, that was, you know, in many ways what it was like in the military, a little more uh, uh, good, good natured competition. But um, in many ways, everybody understood we're all working to the same goal. And that's what's so cool about being in this space is that that seems to be the same mindset. That's exactly right. And again, back to some of the leaders that have hit the headlines over this summer. Uh, I don't know if we would be talking about that last year at this time. You yeah. know, we always envisioned that when we first met of what do you see next year coming or even in two years. And we see three major launches this year alone and how just those alone got so much gravity. I think they were the number one shows on the talk shows throughout. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of weeks, people were driving my email and inbox. They weren't caring, frankly, about a lot of the other issues. They were talking about, hey, who's going to be the first one to space? And it was that same kind of energy, that drive, that passion, that excitement that was coming up there. And I was getting texts from people I didn't know. I thought, okay, the Chinese hacked my phone again or something, you know, following me, or, you know, yeah. you and your Intel background, I'm, you remember those things kind of come to mind. I'm like, no, we're just asking because you're the space guy from Washington. So I started getting this whole thing and even our ranking member uh, on the minority caucus started calling me, oh no, he's uh, you know, cyber command guy, but he's also our space commander and he's kind of leading the space effort. So I get this nickname and it starts going out in the different areas going, oh, we know you. They don't even ask me my last name anymore <laughs> because it's too hard to say. I'm just that yeah. space guy. And they were talking about space stuff with me. So it's incredible. And I'm honored yeah. to do that, by the way. It's great. No, it's and it, you know, your combination of passion and background seems to be a perfect fit for that because um, you know, that's what we need is those advocates who can speak about it and understand and sort of bridge the gap between what I say call the nerds and the public. Well, that's exactly right. And it gets to what you said before. And I think that's the core to kind of stay focused on this. Our goal is sustainability. We talk about uh, talk about space garbage, but the other area is that routine to making it boring. People said, well, that's not flashy. That's not a hashtag that we can follow. That's not going to trend. I said, well, it is when you get to the point of <clears throat> we didn't know Uber was going to be normal or Lyft or these things nowadays, or we've all gone to apps to kind of get through COVID uh, just a couple of years ago. And I still have people in my constituents that don't like doing online banking. I go, that's the norm. That's what people yeah. are used to. A couple of years ago, we didn't, we were worried about people stealing our data or information. And now I said, you know, we're talking about space sports. They're like, what? Uh, yeah, that's in our backyard. Let's talk about the space academy. People need to be trained up to get in this industry to know what's going on. We need to pivot our manufacturing to showcase where we can build those widgets, those things that can be a part of the space ladders, the different institutions, the programs that are out there. And how do we can do that at the, the state policy level to make sure that's a smooth transition to where they can allow that innovation, that research, that development. And, you know, it's just that excitement. I'm like, it opened up the door. A lot of people, they just kind of look at you and go, really? Because I think I get that look when I ran my first space bill a couple of years ago, my first year up there, people are like, you, uh, you really understand what the state legislature is about? You know how to run a bill? I kept getting the looks like, I know you're new at this, but... <laughs> I said, no, I got this. I did my research being a military officer. I, I asked my ports, my local community leaders, my chamber of commerce said, what's one of the big things we can do here in the Tri-Cities? And in ag country, even farmers said, 
you know, that'd be kind of cool having space, bring space to our area. And then mm -hmm. the land we have to offer up, we have areas that are free and clear for the FAA to do things. We still have Navy. I know uh, Navy flights going through here to practice in our area. So I'm being a pilot. I love to bring aviation here, especially the space industry. Yeah, no, and I'm fascinated to hear, you know, as you're out talking about this and, you know, as you said, one of the first things you did was this space bill. And so no doubt in your district during your reelection campaign and others, this came up. Um, what was the response? A lot of it was kind of questioning me going, maybe he doesn't know some of the, because the first question always is, what are the top three issues that are impacting yeah. your neighborhood and your community? And I said, economic development, you know, and education always seem to be the top ones. And mm -hmm. in our area, we're within 25 miles of about 40% creation of uh, generation of energy from mm -hmm. electrical grid to resilience on the grid. We have hydro, wind, solar, and even nuclear power that goes pretty much 90% to the city of Seattle and the Puget Sound area. Wow. So we're really the backbone of an industry that needs to be killing. We see the firefighters throughout this summer in the last couple of years, sadly. That are having problems and even a grid that's going into brownouts in most of the states because of the issues from texas in the freeze to california in the heat and people turning these we need to get resilience and on and the way we can move forward how do we do that on 50 year old technology that's sticking around there's got to be something we can do to innovate and change the way we're doing the same thing we can't run high powered lines through people's backyards anymore we have to innovate and showcase where we can not only create the generation of the energy, but transmit it to out a grid that's interconnected every day and diversify that. And so people are looking at me and goes, how does space come into there? I said, because that's the innovation, that's the research, that's where we learn so much. And it opens people's eyes when I put my other hat on as an educator uh, and a professor, I try to get into that learning and teaching element part of it and break it down for them. I said, this is innovation, but it's also workforce development. It's looking at that manufacturing, it's showing diversity. We have a large Hispanic population in my community and their eyes popped out of their head. They're just like, really, we can be a part. I said, you guys can lead the effort. And then when I tell again, the showcasing of what Kayla Barron has done, people are like, wait, she's from Richland. I said, yeah, <laughs> she's right here about a mile from where I'm you know, coming to you from, and it's amazing seeing women take the lead effort and showcasing in NASA and these other areas that they can lead in a space industry from now and into the future. Yeah, no, and you know, I, when I've talked at community colleges and to these technicians around the country, the, the way their eyes light up when you start talking about you know, how they can continue to do what they know they're good at. Uh, and also be a part of this exciting new economic sector is, you know, like seeing my kids on Christmas when I actually get the presents right. Uh, it's, it's amazing. That's exactly right. And I mean, it comes back to, like you said, even as mine, my parents got us Legos and going through that whole thing. My dad is an engineer. My brothers are engineers. So I come from that, that technology background and that engineering side. And my mom was in education for 37 years. So it comes back to that premise of here's some core values that you can keep your kids off the TV set or Xboxes, which my kids still love, you know, and try to get me on. But, and then you go into, you see Lego, showcasing what's gone on in the space industry and those little things go a long way i have a niece who has a daughter who's already playing with uh, the space shuttle legos mm, and yeah. she's already looking at different things and she's like this is very cool and she's always looking to the stars and when she hears something fly by her house she always says there's uncle matt he's flying that thing whether it's an airplane or a helicopter, it doesn't matter. Apparently, yeah. I'm the most highly rated air, you know, <laughs> uh, pilot in the world because she thinks I'm I'm certified to fly anything that flies over our house. So yeah. it's incredible. I, I bet you didn't know that, Tim. No, but no, I, I've, I've heard if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. But I guess if you can fly a helicopter, you can fly anything. <laughs> that's exactly uh, right. So congrats. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I know we're, we're coming up on time, but I, I wanted to, you know, close with the question of, you know, as you, you know, represent this district uh, that, you know, may not be a stereotypical space district, um, what, what are you seeing as potential jobs and potential economic development for your constituents? What's like most exciting? 
I think one of the big ones, and again, uh, thank you for having me this morning. It's always exciting to talk to you and see you. It's good to see you doing well and staying safe and healthy and, and the team here. Uh, but being a part of this is that exciting stuff. You could tell even at, at 7 a.m. on the West Coast, I'm excited to be talking about this. I'll wake up, stay late at night. Um, the exciting part will keep the people interested in the opportunities that people come to me now is saying, uh, what can we do to help out and be in that part of, you mentioned, from the training workforce development, our local community colleges, but also Washington State University, University of Washington, are looking at other degree programs. They're already mm -hmm. looking at certifications where individuals can go into and, and showcases. Our, our future plans have community uh, chambers of commerce working with, you know, angel investors to showcase, hey, we can do this better. They're in classes and they want to drop out like they've heard in the other people, like, we can do this better, we can do this smarter, we can do it more efficient. And it yeah. shows. These kids are smart. We got a great wealth of talent in our communities and you never know where they're going to come from. It's that whole thing. When you look at football in the drafts, it used to be the division one schools. Mm -hmm. Now people are coming from division two and other places. If you are performing and you showcase that hard work, that dedication, that innovation, you'll come from anywhere. And then that wealth of talent will, I believe, always rise to the top. And those showcase where we can pivot that manufacturing we talked about before, we could showcase the jobs in the nuclear, solar, and that energy sector, how yeah. we can do it more effective and efficient with these new technologies. And I'm excited to be a part of that. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we've, we've gotten to where we got on the backs of people who, you know, were at the MITs, at the Stanfords, you know, big names from big schools with big ideas. And now it's time to operationalize that and institutionalize it. And that is done by hardworking people doing what they love and are good at in hundreds and thousands of different professions. And um, it's time to stop pretending that you need a fancy degree or, you know, in the case of astronauts, basically a gold medal to get to space. Uh, <laughs> Exactly right. And that's where reducing the barriers is key. Yeah. It's showcasing what we can do of, uh, frankly, getting the government out of the way, like you mentioned, and saying this is not that hard to do. Let's make it boring again. Let's make it routine. Let's make it you can just drive down the road and I can go to the spaceport. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't need to wait two hours to go to my airport when I can effectively, efficiently get onto a spaceport and then get on a device and I can go places. And I can't yeah. wait for the AI, the artificial intelligence, the drone technologies, those things we could even mention. We could talk for hours. A lot of that technology that's coming and uh, I'm excited to work with that as well. So, yeah, no, agreed. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Banky. This was this was great. And I can't wait to get out to Washington State and meet you. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again. No, thank you very much. And again, go Hawks. Uh, thanks, Congressman Banky, from your friends in Tacoma. We appreciate your effort. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me again. Good to see you. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Nice. <laughs> Really enjoyed that conversation. Lots of excitement, uh, even from one of our core folks who's been doing this a long time. So just really appreciate that conversation. Our next speaker is Dr. George Neald. He's the president of Commercial Space Technologies, LLC, which was established to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space activities. He served as the Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation at the Federal Aviation Administration from 2008 to 2018. Dr. Neald has over 30 years of aerospace experience with the Air Force, at NASA, and in private industry. A graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, he holds an MS and PhD in Aeronautics and Astronautics from Stanford University and an MBA from George Washington University. He's also a flight test engineering graduate of the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. And more importantly, he has spoken now several times on Conversations for the Future and Blue Marble Week, and it's always a real honor to have him here. George, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to talk to the group today. Can you see my we, screen? We can see your screen and there you are in presentation mode. 
Excellent. Well, I think the topic for this week's sessions is really perfect. I've got a little bit of a different take on an out of the box approach that I'd like to share with the group today in terms of how to deal with some of these issues like garbage recycling and sustainability. But first, I'd like to talk about an upcoming space activity that I think could be potentially very historic. And that is the Inspiration4 mission coming up with a launch probably next week. They're tar currently targeting September 15th, I believe. And on that mission, four individuals will be flying in a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft and launched on a Falcon 9 rocket from launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center and traveling to orbit. But it's going to be a very significant milestone, I believe, in terms of our overall space activities. Let's talk a minute about who's going to be flying. Jared Isaacman is the commander of the mission, and he has founded a financial payment company that has been very successful over the years. He's also an experienced pilot, having flown commercial and military jets in air shows and many other activities. Haley Arsenault is a childhood cancer survivor who is currently working as a physician assistant at the very hospital where she received her cancer treatment. Dr. Cyan Proctor is a geoscience professor who is a member of the Civil Air Patrol, a certified scuba diver, and has become an accomplished space artist. Chris Sembrowski used to be a space camp counselor. He worked as an Air Force technician on Minutemen missiles many years ago and now works in the aerospace industry. Each of those individuals has a fascinating life story and I encourage you to read up on them if you've not done so already. But what makes this upcoming mission so special is not their unique backgrounds, but what they have in common. Namely, none of them is a professional astronaut. And this will be the first time that we've had a human spaceflight go to orbit without a professional astronaut on board. So it takes us a huge step forward in terms of the dream that many people have for making space more accessible to the broad masses of the public. And of course, all this is happening after a very exciting year, including things like SpaceX's tests of their Starship down at Boca Chica, Texas, launches of small satellites from Rocket Lab and Virgin Orbit. Northrop Grumman has sent cargo missions to the International Space Station. SpaceX has had the opportunity to send NASA astronauts to the ISS. And then of course, just in July, we had Richard Branson fly on Virgin Galactic's Spaceship Two on a suborbital mission. And Jeff Bezos fly along with his brother and the oldest and the youngest people ever to visit the edge of space. So it's been a very exciting time in commercial space. If you look at the number of launches, the numbers are just mind boggling. This fiscal year, there have been 57 FAA licensed commercial launches, far in excess of what we've ever seen in history. And of course, there's still several weeks left in the year to continue to increase that total. And as a, we have discussed before, the global space economy continues to grow. Bryce Space and Technology estimates that it currently totals about $366 billion. And of course, the interesting part that you can see on this chart is that government spending 
is the area in the brown in the upper left-hand corner of the chart. That's only about 25%. The other 75% of the global space economy is non-government spending, individuals, companies. So that is where the excitement is going to take us, I think, in the future as the rest of the economy continues to grow. Meanwhile, the financial experts from many different organizations, including UBS, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America, are all forecasting that the global space economy will ex exceed $1 trillion in just the next 20 years. And yet, and yet, there is a huge potential obstacle to progress, not only for the commercial sector, but also for the civil sector and the national security sector as well. General Raymond, the chief of space operations and the new US Space Force has talked about this many times in his speeches. And he says that space today is kind of the wild, wild west. So why does that matter? Well, space is becoming increasingly congested. The number of countries and companies operating in space is continuing to grow. However, there is no US government department or agency that is responsible for promoting space safety and sustainability. Let's review what the existing regulatory framework looks like. The FAA, where I, where I worked for many years, is responsible for licensing commercial launches and re-entries, but not what happens in between. So after next week's Inspiration4 mission launches, under an FAA launch license, once the Dragon reaches orbit, the FAA is out of the picture until it's time to come back home in the re-entry. The FCC is responsible for licensing radio broadcasts from space. NOAA has responsibility for licensing remote sensing operations, such as taking pictures of the Earth. DOD and NASA are obviously key players in space, but they're not regulatory agencies. And even more important, looking forward, we've got the Outer Space Treaty, which was signed by the United States back in 1967, and which has now been ratified by more than 100 different countries all around the world. And it says that the, art, the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space shall require authorization, and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. And unfortunately, in the United States right now, current law and policy does not clearly identify who, if anyone, has that responsibility. So let's take a look at some of the usual suspects here. NASA has a very comprehensive mission they talk about exploration. They talk about new knowledge, growing the, the economy, increasing our understanding of the universe, improving technologies and so forth. Great stuff. No mention of space safety though. How about the Air Force? Well, they have a pretty punchy phrase here. The mission of the United States Air Force is to fly, fight, and win. Air power, anytime, anywhere. Love it. But no mention of space safety. How about the Space Force? Of course, that's part of the Department of the Air Force now. They have a more academic, functional mission that they have adopted. And it talks about working to organize, train, and equip space forces. Good stuff but no mention of space safety. How about the Department of Commerce? That was the focal point, if you will recall, of the Space Policy Directive 3 that President Trump signed 
three years ago. Well, the mission of the Department of Commerce is to create the conditions for economic growth and opportunity. Excellent stuff. No mention of space safety. And if you dive down into the depths of commerce, the Office of Space Commerce is actually a part of NOAA. And the mission of NOAA provide daily weather forecasts, severe storm warnings, very important stuff. No mention of space safety. How about the Department of Transportation? That's the department that has responsibility for regulating all of our modes of transportation. We've got highways, we've got rail, we've got maritime, we've got air. And sure enough, they talk about safety, which is good. But the part of the department that has responsibility for space is the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. And they are focused on what happens in the national airspace system, launch and reentry and operating spaceports. Their authority does not extend to on-orbit operations. So again, inspiration four, once they're on orbit, FAA does not have a role. So what can we do about that? Well, there's lots of different ideas. There's certainly many options for dealing with these issues. But after talking to a lot of people, doing a lot of reading and thinking about what might be the best way ahead, I've come across a very interesting proposal that's based on an analogy with the US Coast Guard. The Coast Guard has a long history in this country. Its predecessor, the uh, Revenue Cutter Service was actually formed in 1790 as a part of the US Treasury, believe it or not. And it's evolved and expanded over the years, but has a very important role today in maritime activities. If you look at the Coast Guard mission, the mission of the United States Coast Guard is to ensure our nation's maritime safety, security, and stewardship. Those three pieces I find very interesting that I think have a lot of potential applicability to what we're talking about for space. The detailed responsibilities for the Coast Guard are found in, in 11 different specific statute directed programs, including things like port, waterway, and coastal security, aids to navigation, search and rescue, something we're all familiar with, marine safety, environmental protection, polar and ice operations, and law enforcement. There's a lot of areas that I think would have applicability to what we're talking about for space. So I think the way that we can tame the wild, wild west in space might be to establish a US Space Guard that's roughly modeled on what we do for the US Coast Guard. Now it would have both regulatory and operational responsibilities, just like the Coast Guard does. It would be part of the Department of Transportation during peacetime, but during wartime, it would be integrated with the Department of Defense in support of the US Space Force. A proposed mission might look something like this. The mission of the United States Space Corps would be to enhance the safety of space operations and to preserve the space environment. Very similar to those top level responsibilities of the Coast Guard. Some of the Space Guard responsibilities could include first, Authorize and continuously supervise non-governmental space flight activities by US entities. That's the gap in the Outer Space Treaty that we need to plug. It could include working to develop space flight safety standards, guidelines, and recommended practices. Rather than having those be haphazard or just random, 
This would provide government oversight and, and focus for those very important activities. And it could serve as the lead US government agency for space traffic management. That's something that's been debated for a long time. There's been talk about whether that belongs in commerce or the FAA. Well, it could be part of a space guard within the Department of Transportation. And again, the top level roles could include developing and maintaining a public catalog of space objects, distributing warnings to avoid potential collisions, those are responsibilities that are done to some extent by the Air Force today and the Space Force, but also to promote orbital debris mitigation and cleanup. That's an area where we don't have government engagement today. A lot of interesting private sector engagement and involvement and some interest in our international partners, but no US government focus on that. And then finally, to develop capabilities and plans for astronaut rescue. I don't think we need to wait for another Apollo 13 type of scenario before we start thinking about, talking about, planning for rescuing astronauts, whether they're US, commercial, government, or international. I think that's one of the characteristics that a, a, a lead nation can have in the space activities. Other potential responsibilities perhaps at some point in the future, could include things like launch range management. The Air Force is actually trying to see if they can disengage from their roles at the Eastern and Western Ranges right now. now. Satellite inspection and repair, prevention of harmful interference, whether we're talking about interfering frequencies or getting too close to communication satellites and geo, or uh, keeping out of each other's way when we start having bases on the moon, those are all very important things that need, I think, a government focus and advocate. Aids to navigation, GPS has grown well beyond its original military purpose and planetary defense against NASA has some preliminary work ongoing, but again, that's not necessarily right in line with NASA's typical exploration responsibilities. If we're really serious about being bold, I think we have an opportunity with a space guard to consolidate and streamlining our existing regulatory framework by actually transferring some functions from other organizations. So you can take that small group of about 100 people that do launch and reentry licensing in the FAA. You can take the folks that do radio broadcast licensing from the FCC, and you can take remote licensing from remote sensing licensing from NOAA and pull them together to form the, the core of the beginning of a space guard in DOT. I think such a change would significantly simplify the approval process for commercial space operators rather than going to all these different departments and agencies to do the mother may I, can I get your signature on this form? Very confusing and time consuming process today that would really help to, to make it more efficient. I think it would also elevate and allow timely resolution of space issues during interagency discussions by having the Space Guard as the focal point and the lead agency for many of these responsibilities. That doesn't mean they do all things space, but they have somebody at the table that can be a facilitator, a coordinator, and an advocate for things related to space. So just to, to summarize some of the potential benefits, I think establishing a US Space Guard would allow us to, to strengthen our national security capabilities by allowing the DOD and the Space Force to focus on space war fighting and preventing wars in space. It can maximize safety, stability, and operational sustainability, the various things we're talking about this week. It can streamline the regulatory framework, work to enforce treaties, laws, and regulations. And, and really enable the success of the private sector by taking the uncertainty and the burden out of our space regulatory processes. And with the proper leadership and direction, I think it could also help us to operate at the speed of business, not the typical speed of government. I have to point out that the idea of a space guard is not a, a brand new idea. 
Lieutenant Colonel Cynthia McKinley actually wrote a very detailed proposal with that idea back over 20 years ago in the Aerospace Power Journal and a number of other uh, space policy experts and, and military uh, leaders have also voiced their support. Interestingly, the National Space Society has also had two separate position papers from 2017 and 2018 that talked about this very idea. Now, many of these people may well have been just ahead of their time. But as we look at the kind of progress that has been made in space, especially in the commercial space sector these days, and the exciting things that we see happening in just the next decade or two, I think the time is right now to establish a US space card. And I'd love to hear some of the ideas of the other speakers and the participants in this session today as they think about this option for our future. Once again, thanks for, for having me on and I look forward to questions and further discussion on, on the panel. Thanks, Lee. Thank you so much, George. Uh, fascinating idea and uh, glad to hear it's been in the consciousness. Michael Lane is gonna join us to do some of the Q&A um, and we've got some great discussion going on in the chat. So he, I'm sure he'll bring that in um, and we'll introduce Michael with Pete but he's gonna jump on right now. Oh, uh, Leo, would you allow Michael to unmute himself? Let's see. Uh, I'm having technical hey. issues. I'm sorry, I was here a moment ago. There we go, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, if you need me, I've I've got. No, no, I got it. Okay. I got it. I was just having technical issues. I'm uh, sorry about Great that. Good to see you. Um, I, uh, Dr. Neal, thank you as always. Super helpful that you're here. Uh, it really, um, uh, you know, expands the conversation. I think it's necessary. So I really appreciate that you're here, sir. Um, I love the idea that Space Guard exists. I was uh enthusiastically excited about what became space force but i didn't want it to be space force i want it to be space core i think names matter in this case um and and i think space core as i envisioned it a, a couple of years ago and space force as, as it is now needs to be functionally different from your proposed space guard. So I really like how you clearly defined what this space guard should be and, and, and the sort of chain of command, political chain of command, operational chain of command, pulling assets that exist in other organizations into this newly defined program. Um, big fan, big fan of all, of all of the things that you described. I think it's somewhat important that you go a little deeper into its history, uh, if you could, because uh, you know that gives us context. Uh, so I know we don't have a lot of time, but if you could dig a little deeper into the history of it, I think that would be really helpful. So again, uh, there've been a number of uh, papers written uh, that, that talk about it, each with a slightly different flavor. Yeah. Uh, some of them were, focused on, you know, the, the key is space commerce and we need this government entity to enable the commerce. And, and that's good. But I think as we look around today, we're also seeing the uh, disaggregated regulatory responsibilities among so many different right. offices. And frankly, as a former public servant, I can say the people are trying to do the right thing. It is, yeah. FCC, especially lately, is really leaning forward, but it's not necessarily coordinated with the rest of the government. And as a result, there's either duplication or confusion on who's got what role. Uh, as we've seen the formation of the Space Force, uh, that's a huge milestone in terms of, of the military recognizing the importance of space. Uh, I think as we see more and more activity though, having safety 
and sustainability are going to be important to all of us. And right now, that is not the job of the Space Force. And at it's least not for non-NASA job. missions, it's not the job of NASA either. We, we think, oh, NASA, space. No. But again, they have no role in the upcoming Inspiration4 mission. Uh, there are other activities, commercial space stations, satellite servicing, moon bases, asteroid mining, all those things that'll be totally separate from Space Force and from NASA. And so is there an opportunity for us to have government oversight and engagement without being burdensome, without being right. militaristic, frankly? Right. Uh, and I think the Coast Guard is an interesting analogy for that. So uh, certainly deserves some more thought as we think about what we want our future to look like. Uh, absolutely. I think... Um... You know, in order to kind of figure out how to go forward, we have to look at how where we've been so far. And there's, you know, th there's that old rule of, you know, try to never serve two masters, two bosses, two, two chiefs, right? And you have this, I would say bifurcated, but it's actually, it's, I think there's five or six or seven different layers that are all, uh, all trying to have a say in what happens next. And if you were to streamline this under the banner of a space force, a space guard, um, all of these disparate activities under one house would make for a cleaner uh, chain of command, a, chain of, a cleaner process, right? Yes, I completely agree. Now I'll acknowledge this is not the only way that you could no. solve those problems. Right. right. Absolutely true. But I, I think, interestingly, it could be a lot harder to fix by trying to change, adapt, evolve an existing organization, because that's not how they're used to doing business. Well, and all of if those other organizations with a, key, with a clean set of marching orders, you can do some amazing things. Really, truly. Uh, all of those different organizations have different leadership, different marching orders, ultimately different objectives. And by not having a clean path and a single uh, chief, if you will, uh, in charge, you're getting different rules and, and, and sometimes very, con very convoluted, complex and conflicting rules. Uh, so, I mean, it, that's great if you happen to be a space lawyer. It's not so great if you're a small private company trying to navigate Washington, D.C. So. Uh, from the from the commercial commercial space cislunar econosphere perspective, I really want a simplified set of rules. Um, yeah, terrific. Um, uh, there's one question I was going to ask. We don't have a lot of time for it, but how would this get done? Like, what would be the next step? Not not all the steps, but what would you think is the very first next step? So interestingly, uh, most of the FAA's responsibilities for space actually talk about the Secretary of Transportation shall. Okay. That's the way Congress wrote the laws. And okay. then there was administrative uh, executive branch decisions. Well, let's put it in the FAA. Let's do this. It actually started out as an office in, in the Department of Transportation okay. due to uh, FAA back in the 90s. But I think it would be relatively easy to, to reconstitute basically a, an umbrella organization with a, with a leader and a small staff at the Department of Transportation with the mission of, of let's start out with either detailed or matrixed uh, reporting from FCC, FAA, Commerce, NOAA, and so forth. And, and then over time, we can uh, adapt budgets and, and statutory responsibilities. But just having that central focus, I think would go a long way towards coordinating things and making it easy for someone coming knocking on the door. Hey, I wanna launch something to space. Who do I talk to? Terrific. Uh, given how many people are going to space and how big that field is gonna be, a streamlined path has got to be a part of the administration's goals. Uh, there's too much going on for uh, this crazy corral of, uh, of of disorganized. I mean, great people. They're they're great people. Don't 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 misinterpret that. But um, we have to get this right. We really do. 
All right, sir, thank you so much for your time. We're going to come back to this in a little bit with the panel. Uh, turn it over to Lee. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much, George. I'm really excited for more discussion in the panel. Um, and I want to welcome Michael here today, a fundamental driving force behind Conversations for the Future since the very beginning. Uh, Michael founded the Liftport Group with the idea that the elevator to space could and should be built commercially. The concept for Liftport was simple, to develop the subsystems and precursor technologies needed for the elevator and to commercialize those as a method of payment for the larger, longer-term project of building the elevator. Areas of focus are robotics, nanotech, and materials sciences, finance, and media. Thanks for taking over today. We'll, we'll uh, have you doing all these uh, through the panel and really, really always enjoy the conversations that you drive. It, it's always terrific being here. Thanks a lot, Lee. Appreciate it. And Pete Garretson is our next speaker. A senior fellow in defense studies at the American Foreign Policy Council, Mr. Garretson is an independent strategy consultant who focuses on space and defense. He has 33 years of experience working with the Department of Defense and served his country in the U.S. Air Force, including as director of the Space Horizons Task Force at the U.S. Air Force Air Command and Staff College. He is currently working on his PhD in public policy at Auburn University and has his master's in aviation and human factors from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He is a former member of the National Space Society Board of Directors, a thought leader in the area of space development, and he is currently writing a book on the great power competition for space resources. I hope you'll give us an update on how that's coming along, Pete, and the screen is yours. Thank you. All right, let me get my uh, screen up. So there actually is an update to, uh, uh, to that. And the book is now published, Scramble for the Skies, with my co-author, Dr. Namrata Goswami. Oh, yes, that one. And, uh, and so I'm going to contextualize what I say within the, the context of the, the major thesis of the book. So the book essentially says that Policymakers have started to wake up to the broader conversations that people in the advocacy community have had about um, the, uh, the economic potential of space and in particular space resources, and that you see competition. And that competition is going to basically determine uh, who's going to be the, the major power for the century ahead that this will probably take, uh, we can't be sure that if we were to surrender that to another power, that they would uh, order things the same way that, that we would want them ordered. So within that context, global public goods are important and the institutions they build are important because how other nations choose, uh, or I should say that in, in sort of the, the uh, international relations theory that we propound, you know, nation states are competing, but of course they're competing as part of a, of a broader sort of leadership order where you have a lot of participants. Well, ultimately you have to have followers in that leadership order. You can kind of think about this as like a, a dog pack, wolf pack. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the alpha wolf is not going to get the other wolves to come along if they're not organizing the hunt, making sure that, you know, things are happening the way they should. And so one of the things that clearly is of interest to the entire world, not just spacefaring nations, is the management of the, of the debris and management of the, the broader area to begin with. And so uh, I consider this discussion on space force and space guard to be very important. So I'm gonna, yeah, I was asked to talk a little bit about that as well as to talk about debris. So let me uh, then just talk about, you know, these three words. I, I absolutely agree, words matter. And so, you know, uh, some, of, some of the audience may be familiar with how this played out and others may not. So core, um, you know, has of course the connotation of a body uh, there have been, you know, numerous important cores that were uh, uh, conceptualized and, and as part of this, this broader debate about what sort of uh, 
police and military function should we have in space? And so the Corps was a, you know, originally an, an army term. And that, uh, you know, that, uh, that term meant, a, you know, a large body. And today we have several important corps, in particular, the Corps of Engineers is important because they are a military unit that has civilian regulatory capacity. They were important in building canals, important in building roads. They remain important in building our levees. They conduct and build uh, works of, uh, 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 of public utility. And so, you know, in many ways, that meaning, uh, many have suggested that we still need sort of a space corps of engineers that might do the sort of global public good type of things like dredging the space harbor of debris, you know, or building public works on the moon or constructing an initial solar power satellite or helping maintain it or doing planetary defense operations. So there's the sort of the core of engineers concept. Then there were uh, predecessors to what became the Air Force. Those would have been the Signal Corps that was initially you know, doing things very similar for the Army that the Space Force today is doing for the Joint Force. So they were providing you know, all the different signals and they initially got the airplanes. And then as airplanes became more important, they uh, broadened. Uh, there was a need to sort of establish this as a unique cadre of individuals that knew something special. And so they became a, uh, the Air Corps. And so in that sense, Corps means a subordinate organization with a very specific sort of expertise. So when I think of Corps, of course, you, you think of the Marine Corps and their original you know, niche capability to move on ships to, to do expeditionary ops and then later to do amphibious ops, as well as, um, you know, sort of the, uh, the specific expertise that you might have in say, you know, our, uh, our submariner force and particularly their, uh, their nuclear cadre where they sort of manage themselves. Now force, uh, force, is sort of uh, in the context of a maneuver force. You know, that is the name chosen by the Air Force to sort of assert an independence, to suggest that it has this independent maneuver advantage, that it can be used independently, decisively as a, as a tool of force, typically, you know, associated with strategic bombing and, uh, you know, and, and fighter aircraft. And then you have guard. And so guard, you know, uh, usually is associated with uh, the Coast Guard, but more generally, you know, to guard and protect things that are Im important for you. So force has sort of an offensive sound, guard has more of a protective sound. And the Coast Guard, you know, as George put out, has this very, very broad mandate of many things that it has, including law enforcement. Um, and it's multi-mission and it's safety of navigation. Now, how do these play out into what has become the Space Force and, and this broader question? So I would say that the that you know what what actually happened here was that you had a group of scholars that felt that there was a need to consolidate space expertise and to broaden their mission in guard-like missions, who um, put this forward uh, toward an eventual independence because they felt that space was strategic. And why did they think it was strategic? Really for the reasons discussed uh, above here, which is this context, right? So the, the people who are arguing for a space force weren't really primarily motivated by the fact that there was suddenly a power that was building anti-satellite weapons. They were motivated by the fact that the, the entire future of who is a great power and what is the future of human freedom is going to be determined in space. And that space becomes its own primary theater of operations and requires that people think about this as a component of great power. Well, that necessitates 
its own special group of people who are thinking about that, that have some level of autonomy. And so an intermediate step from a core to whatever that final function was going to be uh, was supposed to be a core. And the design of a core would have been something that is distinct enough from the Air Force, but still housed within the Department of the Air Force, much like the Marine Corps, as sort of a halfway house to uh, full independence. And that was the position taken by Dr. Coyote Smith and then taken up by um, Congressman Rogers and Congressman Cooper. And then that got elevated to this even broader idea of like, why don't we just go full independence now? And so there was an attempt to put it, uh, it the, the phrasing was, uh, the branding was Space Force, and it was initially intended to be its own department, but that got walked back. And so we have something called a Space Force that's actually a Space Corps that is doing a lot of what we would consider guard missions today. So if you look at the things that the Coast Guard do, they maintain lighthouses, they help them in traffic management. Well, two of the primary functions of the Space Force today is the maintenance of our GPS system and the, the maintenance of the, the only space traffic system that we actually have that provides conjunction analysis. And so there was this broader discussion coming within what was at the time the Air Force about what these should be. And so there remains, you know, a, uh, an articulation and, and you heard George sort of say it nicely. Um, what do you want, you know, this Space Force to grow up to be? And do you want them to include guard missions or do you want them to be limited solely to sort of uh, military force? So we call this the narrow mandate or the broad mandate, sometimes called the blue water and the brown water and blue water school of space power. So the, uh, uh, and there are some nuances here, but essentially, you know, there is a, there's no doubt, I think, in, in any space professional's mind that these uh, broader roles are all important. The question is just who should do, who should do planetary defense, who should do, you know, uh, all these different Coast Guard missions, whether it is, you know, safety inspections of, of uh, cruise ships going around the moon or maintenance of nav aids or safety of navigation. Um, and, and particularly space debris, do you orbit, you know, who do you want to do that? Do you want that to be a military force that has a broad mandate and looks more like a guard uh, and is uh, sort of more Star Trek-like? Or do you want to pass that off to somebody else like the Department of Commerce and then maintain the Space Force only as essentially a, a space, uh, an in-space attack and defense force and support of the Joint Force? So this is a very, very active debate internal to the Space Force. And I think the picture is a little more rosy than, uh, than George suggested, but this, uh, um, but it is, I would say, an ongoing culture war about where do we want to go? So now I wanna talk a little bit about the specifics of space debris, because I think this is a, a terrific issue to look at. So of course, you know, when we have, you know, concepts of space debris, you know, we've got all kinds of little things, little, little bolts, little flecks of paint that get thrown off of uh, a spacecraft when they launch. We have large derelict, you know, rocket bodies that continue to inhabit after they've dropped their satellites off. We have satellites that have gone dead. We have, you know, wrenches that have been lost. And, you know, these are mostly concentrated, you know, in this low earth orbit space, um, you know, with a few broader objects out beyond. And just to give you a sense of like, what, you know, what is this? Well, you've got, we are able to track on the order of 23,000 pieces of space debris that are larger than 10 centimeters. And most of them are close to the earth. And we estimate, though we can't reliably see that there are basically a half a million that are one centimeter to 10 centimeter, which are still lethal, and perhaps 100 million down to uh, one millimeter. And it's important to realize that, you know, in LEO, all these are going like Mach 25, and they're going, you know, 
entirely different directions. So you can have collisions that happen at 32,000 miles per hour. And that and into and collisions at that speed are very counterintuitive to how you might think things worked out. And of course, that constitutes a hazard to human beings, it constitutes a hazard to satellites. And when things hit, they, uh, they sort of start in their initial trajectories and then they sort of move apart into these orbital shells. And that can be very, very difficult. Uh, the, the fact that the earth is not perfectly round means that with, when these things aren't controlled, each time they go over uh, parts of the earth that are less round than others, they get slightly deformed into these different uh, areas. And so there's this concern that if you don't deorbit these as big as space is, and obviously this is not to scale, these would be absolutely tiny in comparison, um, but that eventually more will hit more and then that'll just sort of create a chain reaction and eventually we will have fouled entire orbital shells and then you know, uh, and there's an example of, you know, it's sort of one of these hypersonic collisions, then you foul the ability to do exciting things like Starlink or any of the other very large LEO sorts of things. And you also make it unusable for us to uh, bring uh, manned folks in and out. So we are at a place where technically we can start to think about removing space debris, but there are a number of problems with the incentive structure of how to do this. So one of the problems is that uh, we have not set up our insurance in a way that you know, incentivizes this. Another is that our international uh, legal agreements place the responsibility for these objects on the launching state, not on individual companies. And that there is really no, there's no overall coordinating body. Moreover, because these are essentially the, the sovereign property of those nation states, um, it, it, it wouldn't be considered friendly for one nation to deorbit uh, another's. So there's a great need, in my view, for people to start setting precedents. I would love to see, for instance, the United States and one of its partners trade pieces of space debris specifically for deorbit to show that that's cool and then start to deorbit things. I should also point out that there are essentially two major categories of space debris. One are very big objects that, uh, that constitute the, what people consider to be one of the biggest hazards because if they're struck, obviously they have more area, so they're more likely to be struck, but if they're struck, they create many more pieces and so, you know, that creates more of a hazard for everyone. And a lot of those are concentrated in sort of very, uh, uh, very polar-like attitudes, uh, very polar-like uh, orbits where people like to go, you know, for Earth observation. So removing those rocket bodies is a big deal. So let's talk about, and then the other is the very small pieces. So there are two general approaches, and, and these matter because they are, uh, extremely dual use. So on the one hand, you have a general idea of sending something up, you know, like a space tug or something, could be an electromagnetic tether, but you send something up that grabs a piece of space debris and then it re-enters. And this is really, you know, the, the only way to go out. And there are all kinds of different ways of imposing drag, you know, whether or not you're doing this propulsively, whether you're doing this electromagnetically, um, whether or not you're, you know, deploying some, some very large, you know, balut or something that looks like a solar sail that drags it down. But essentially, you know, you have to expend, you know, significant energy to bring these down or to bring them up or potentially to consolidate and reuse them. But there's very little incentive to do this. And so there's, a, there's definitely an opportunity for government leadership. But let me point out, that if you've got the capability to go up and grab a piece of space debris, you also have the ability to go up and grab a, a functioning satellite. And so that constitutes, you know, what, you know, what folks might consider to be an anti-satellite, a co-orbital anti-satellite weapon, if it were used in that fashion. And so we have to think carefully about 
this signaling uh, and, and who we want to do that. And I think this plays both ways for and against the Space Force. Then uh, whether it's in space or on the ground, whether it's just light, light pressure or whether or not it's ablative, essentially lasers can be used or are thought to be able to be used to be able to uh, zap a piece of space debris and impart a small force so that instead of being in a circular orbit, it is in a, uh, a more elliptical orbit where the, the bottom of the orbit, where it's closest to the earth, the perigee, is inside the atmosphere and so it decays faster. Well, uh, obviously, uh, if you can target a satellite with a laser, either in space or on the ground, that is dual use as a potential weapon. And so a lot of countries would have a, uh, a desire to uh, hold that close or regulate that in some manner. I should also point out that lasers going up can also uh, dazzle and blind both satellites and aircraft. So, you know, that, that's an important consideration. Um, and then the moment you touch something and it starts moving down, it's moving through other orbits. And so you are incurring the possibility of, uh, of injuring other satellites and, uh, and creating more debris on the way down. So you obviously want uh, somebody who is uh, competent to be doing that. Now, we saw this, this uh, in the last administration, this move to, to sort of unburden the US Space Force from space traffic management and put that into the Department of, of Commerce. And so you certainly could consider wherever you locate a, if you were to locate a space guard, they certainly could take on these missions. But let me point out that in, in neither case, just calling it a space guard does not make this any less threatening uh, to other nations. You know, uh, whether or not China calls their space debris, you know, robotic arm, um, you know, a space debris thing, you know, the United States still uh, is inclined to interpret that as a, as a potential, you know, weapon. And so, you know, you, you may or may not do better having a civilian agency do this. Uh, you know, many people don't know just how deep the, uh, the interrelationships are between militaries and how well they coordinate. Uh, for instance, navies coordinate a lot. And the, the United States might actually do better being perceived that its space force uh, uses its assets to do global public goods. Now, um, as I said, you know, there is significant thought uh, about, you know, within the space force about uh, what its missions should be. And I would say one of the early things was this wonderful paper by, uh, by one of the space force uh, material leaders, um, uh, Josh Worley, who conceptualized exactly how we would set up a, uh, you know, what he, a space debris mitigation directorate under what has become the Space Systems uh, Center. And then, you know, generally speaking, you know, when, when we were conceptualizing Space Force, this terrific paper by uh, Grant and Neil, The Case for Space, really laid out the, a, a, uh, and provided the legislation for a broad mandate uh, Space Force that would conduct all these, paper, uh, all these missions and would have law enforcement. And I would also recommend Dr. Brent Zarnick's book on developing national space power, which showcases this broader thinking. And so, you know, thinkers like Dr. Smith have thought about all the different things that at the time a space corps should be able to do. And you see on orbit inspection, space interdictions, uh, natural resource protection, even settlement law enforcement, but in particular space debris removal and search and rescue. Similarly, others have thought about, you know, what, you know, I think I just saw John Spencer come on. This is one of his thoughts about what all you'd have and all the different sorts of things that a, that a space guard might need to do. And then uh, Dr. Brent Zarnick here was looking at, you know, what does the Coast Guard do today? And then what would a space guard service do in the future? Now, again, this is a bureaucratic choice as to whether or not you want these to be within, you know, what is called the Space Force or what is called, or a separate organization. But if you build a separate organization, that essentially means that 
uh, you have a, a space force that's twiddling its thumbs and is merely an offensive branch and is much less like a you know, global force for good and, and a you know, Star Trek sort of uh, force. Um, but you have to spend double because you have to recreate all those similar capabilities um, uh, in a civilian organization and a civilian organization that is that may eventually have the largest proportion of your actual space weapons capable things. So, you know, a lot of these broader uh, missions have been suggested, stabilizing presence, counter coercion, rescuing personnel, defense support to civil authorities, safety of navigation. And there's this idea that, you know, do you want your message to be you know, the Air Force message of fly, fight, and win sort of war fighting, or do you want it to be more uh, strategic air command, the pieces are profession, you deter by this constant show of capability, and you encourage free riding on global public goods. Um, so a lot of this, I would encourage, you know, if this interests you, please read and perhaps contribute to Space Force Journal. There's a lot of talk about these different uh, uh, missions. Um, a, a particularly terrific uh, uh, article on cislunar uh, uh, missions uh, by Tyler Bates in this latest issue. But I will point out um, that, that actually, you know, just to take a little bit of issue with what George said, the Space Force has sort of said in its capstone doctrine publications, as this very long uh, thing on a core competency, core competency called space security, and where it talks about protecting lines of communication and national space commerce and safety of navigation. And then I would also point out that the national space policy actually tasks the Secretary of Defense to protect freedom of navigation and preserve lines of communication that are open, safe, and secure in the space domain, right? And that, that is presidential policy. Then uh, very recently, the US Space Force has been holding a series of events on Space Futures Workshop. And the forthcoming report, the Space uh, Futures Workshop 2B, has lines in it like US Space Force is committed to the broader strategic purpose of support to support space as a growing element, that the Space Force will be there wherever US commercial interests and activities expand. And then it says, moreover, it is anticipated that by 2040, US Space Force missions may include increased space information services, protection of offensive and defensive operations, but here, are, here you come to the bottom, right? Uh, environmental monitoring and stewardship, space debris cleanup, protection of space critical na national infrastructure, enforcing space law and normative behavior, search uh, and rescue, non-combatant evacuation and planetary defense. So I think that's fairly forward leading. And so, oh, and I would also point out that if you look at what the Space Force is actually doing, they're actually thinking about uh, putting this uh, Cislunar Highway Patrol satellite to extend Cislunar Domain Awareness to be able to see things like space debris and what other actors are doing uh, around the moon. So, you know, in this sense, I think the Space Force is acting very responsibly and sort of thinking through how they might acquire space guard, competen guard competencies and missions. And I think that is my last. Oh, and I would just say that if you want the Space Force to be able to do this type of cutting edge, compelling research, they really need to be better resourced. I mean, take a look at the, uh, the, the last two lines of this. So if you compare the amount of research dollars, which is where you would start doing space debris deorbit, you know, the the, the Space Force has like a tenth the science and technology budget of the other services. And even proportionally, it is not up to speed uh, given its tiny budget. But for such an incredibly important um, avenue of our economy and the ability to sort of protect it, this is a pathetic amount of resources. You know, the entire Space Force is between two and 2.5% of our national defense budget. And if we were to just take the, overall we spend like, you know, a certain percentage of our budget on national defense. Well, if we took that, that particular percentage that we spend 
and apply that to just satellite protection, we should be spending on the order of $8 billion on satellite protection. And you know, here, you know, we need to expand, you know, easily tenfold the amount that we're spending on uh, on space science and technology within the Department of Defense. And that concludes my talk. Terrific info, Pete. And uh, looks like we won't have time for Q&A now, but we'll get to talk with you more about it uh, in the panel uh, after Chris's talk. So our next speaker is Chris Johnson. He's a space law advisor at the Secure World Foundation and a professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center, where he co-teaches the Space Law Seminar. He's also a faculty member at the International Space University and a member of the International Institute of Space Law. Mr. Johnson has written widely on space law and policy issues and represents the Secure World Foundation at the Legal Subcommittee of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. There was so much discussion yesterday uh, where, where we're eager for you to weigh in and set us straight on, on our projections and, and uh, thinking about what could be done and what has been done. I think you're going to shed some light on that. Thank you for being here. The screen is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, please let me know if you can hear me. I sound all right. We can hear you and, and see your slides. All right, great. So thank you, everyone. And I'm going to try and take a couple steps back and, and look at, um, you know, the, the normative framework that we have for space activities. You know, a question was asked earlier, or the view was said, I just wish we had a small set of discrete, simple laws that we could follow. Um, I have bad news for you. In fact, we have a rich tapestry of uh, normativity from binding international legal instruments to soft law instruments down to national policy, national regulation, um, uh, implementing regulation, and then down even to the contractual arrangements that deal with space debris. So I'm going to try and walk through some of that and give you an uh, overview of some of that um, some of that landscape. But just to kind of start off a discussion, you know, I want to, I always put out this idea that when we talk about law, we're not merely talking about activity, the regulation of activity into purely legal or illegal. You know, an activity behavior action is not simply legal or illegal. In fact, when you look deeper into it, it's a number of categories that we can think about. Uh, behavior can be obligatory, meaning you're legally required or mandated to do it. You must positively undertake that behavior. Or behavior such as the exploration and use of outer space under Article One of the Outer Space Treaty is a freedom. You are permitted to do that activity should you so choose, with or without conditions. It's not mandatory that you do it, but you're allowed to do it if you want. In the middle between legal and illegal, we have these legally neutral areas where in fact the law does not uh, regulate or maybe under-regulates a behavior, behavior, doesn't give a clear indication of it, uh, of how it is regulated. That Those gaps may be intentional or that they may in fact be unintentional. Uh, moving further into the prohibited uh, zone, there's behavior which is generally prohibited, but it is permitted with specific license. So you are not allowed to go to space unless you get permission from a national government, for example. And then finally, there is behavior which is prohibited, um, formally outlawed, regulated, and, and explicitly outlawed that we know. So you see that there's actually this, um, uh, you know, this, uh, 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 it's richer than merely legal or illegal. So I say all that now that we can get into talking about uh, the, the framework that we have for space, specifically for uh, space debris, we need to talk about the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. There you see a picture of it being signed at the uh, White House. Uh, so you see President Johnson on the far right of the screen. And it looks like the USSR, UK, and the USA are signing. That's Ambassador Goldberg in the, in the gray sport coat. Uh, signing it on behalf of the United States. Uh, as of September of this year, 111 states parties to the treaty and 23 additional signatories to the treaty. All the major space faring nations, historical space powers, emerging space powers, um, middle space powers. And it's really a symbol to the rest of the world that if you take uh, your national ambitions for space seriously, you sign the Outer Space Treaty. There's a link to for folks to download it uh, on the bottom right. So 
Uh, I'll quickly say that when we talk about the Outer Space Treaty, it, everything is uh, couched in Article 1, freedom of exploration and use. The freedom of exploration and use, that activity shall be the province of all mankind. Uh, further, outer space shall be free for exploration and use, and shall, there, there shall be free uh, access to all areas of celestial bodies. Further on, there should be freedom of scientific investigations. I point that out, Article 1, because balanced against that are a number of obligations. Some of those obligations are, you must undertake this. Some of those obligations are negative obligations. You shall not do this. So one of those positive obligations, uh, states bear international responsibility for their national activities, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities. And they have a further obligation for assuring that national activities are carried out in, conform in conformity with the provisions set forth in the treaty. In fact, a further obligation placed on states. At the bottom, the activities of non-governmental entities shall require authorization and continuing supervision. So there are commercial activities in space, but for the purposes of international law, the purposes of international responsibility, there are national activities, and those national activities are also those non-governmental or commercial activities. That's responsibility. There is a further commitment of liability. States bear an obligation of liability for their launch space objects, which cause uh, physical damage. They are internationally liable for damage. Now, if you if if damage occurs you have not broken the law it merely that it merely says that a obligation of compensation there arises from that and that's your responsibility to pay that that liability obligation in fact that's a relatively unique in international law that you haven't broken the law but a duty of compensation arises for physical damage even if a non-governmental actor causes that damage now Getting further into it, and I hope that you're thinking about what I've said so far in the context of space debris, responsibility and liability, namely. Article 8 then talks about jurisdiction, and states have jurisdiction and control over objects, over their launch space objects, and over any personnel thereof, which they place on their registry. So um, outer space is an area where state sovereignty is severely limited or diminished, and in fact, only a component of state sovereignty exists namely jurisdiction. States have jurisdiction, which is the state power to you know, write rules, enforce those rules, and adjudicate disputes over their launch space objects, which they register, and over any personnel thereof. And that includes space objects which are functioning and indeed uh, non-functioning space objects, i.e. space debris. Now, getting into treatment of the space uh, environment as a, as a environment, uh, Article 9 talks about principles of cooperation and mutual assistance, and it also talks about this principle of due regard. States, to, uh, party to the treaty, shall be guided by the principle of cooperation and mutual assistance and due regard to the corresponding interests of all other states' parties to the treaty. Principles of cooperation and, and mutual assistance and due regard. The second sentence of Article 9 then talks about harmful contamination. State parties to the treaty shall pursue studies of outer space and conduct ex exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination. And this is really Article 9, binding uh, article in a binding international legal instrument that talks about uh, the prohibition of um, causing harmful contamination. This is where we get the ideas about, you know, um, uh, this is the anchor for when we discuss space debris or you know planetary protection uh, and a host of other treatments uh their environmental concerns that are cooked in the treaty even though they you know was negotiated in 1966 and they didn't they weren't deeply thinking about space as an environment and in fact environmentalism and conservationism was really uh new to the new in in the international diplomatic arena so let's move on quickly also there's international consultations uh if you feel that you're going to um cause harmful contamination or you feel that other actors may be causing harmful contamination international consultations are required now i've gone over those basic principles from the outer space treaty i'm gonna go over some later instruments liability convention the Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines from the IADC and from COPUS, the COPUS Long-Term Sustainability Guidelines, and then hopefully get to some space policy directives. But, 
you know, briefly, when we look at the 1972 Liability Convention, has a number of interesting uh, elements. It defines damage. Damage means loss of life, personal injury, or other impairment of health, or loss of or damage to property of states or of persons, natural or juridical, or property of international IGOs. So we, we have a definition of damage. We have a de definition of a launching state. There's kind of four categories of what a launching state is. A state is a uh, launching state is a state which launches or procures the launch or a state from whose territory or facility a object is launched. So in fact, there's different ways to be determined as a launching state. And, you know, as is the case, there are joint launching states. There were back in the 60s and there are today where you look at a particular launch or a space object in space and in determining who that launching state was, you may get a list and maybe not just one launching state. Helpfully, we have a definition of space object, um, but it's not really a, a, an excellent definition. Space object includes component parts of a space object, as well as its launch vehicle and parts thereof. So we have a definition of space object, but in the liability convention and in international space law, don't have a binding definition of what space debris is. But it's generally decided that space debris is a space object, and therefore all those provisions I've spoken about, about responsibility and liability, uh, also apply to space uh, debris. The Liability Convention establishes a fault-based regime for damage in space. In the event of damage being caused elsewhere than on the surface of the Earth, i.e. space, to a space object of one launching state, or to persons or property on board such a space object, by a space object of another launching state, the latter shall be liable only if the damage is due to fault, to its fault or to the fault of persons for whom it is responsible. So while the liability convention establishes absolute liability uh, for damage on the ground, damage in space between space objects and between spacefaring nations and launching states, that damage, um, they will look at the behavior. So it's not merely did the damage occur, and who's, who owns it, they will look at the behavior, the intentions, the actions of those launching states and see whether, in fact, someone was at fault, whether they were negligible. Um, and where there, we have more than one launching state, there's the possibility of joint and several liability, meaning state A and state B launch, damage occurs. Well, the, the person who, uh, the state which suffers the damage can ask for the full amount from state A or from state B, and they can sort it out afterwards, but somebody's paying. So that's what we have from the binding international law. Let's take a step back and, and look at some other sources of, of uh, international instruments. The Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee has worked for a number of years on the debris mitigation guidelines. It is a forum comprised of space agencies, a number of space agencies from around the world. And they have mitigation measures to, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but, you know, limit debris released during normal operations in all op, uh, operational orbit regimes, spacecraft and orbital stages should be designed. So not an obligation, but they say it should be designed not to release debris during normal operations. Uh, also, you see 5.2, minimize the potential for on-orbit breakups, on, um, minimize the potential for post-mission breakups, minimize the potential for breakups during operational phases and avoid intentional destruction and other harmful activities. So that's the IAD, Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines. Also has uh, you know, elements for post-mission disposal, including geosynchronous disposal, um, kind of uh, advanced. It's worth noting right now that these IADC guidelines were revised last year, March. They were revised in, in 2019, and then uh, this version's from, you know, published in 2020. You should take a look at it. Uh, they are technical in nature, but they're also relatively short. Um, but, you know, I think of, of significant normative value, I would say. They also talk about other, orbit, other orbits and the prevention of um, orbit collisions. Um, however, when we look at their application, uh, this is earlier in the document, we see phrases like organizations are encouraged to use these guidelines in identifying the standards and operators of existing spacecraft and orbit stages are encouraged to apply these guidelines. So, you know, it makes sense that a, that a forum of space agencies can't craft international law, but they can certainly develop and be the forum for the development of, you know, what those, what those guidelines should look like on a technical level. 
Um, you know, Frey and Lemons in their paper, Status of the Space Environment, Current Level of Adherence to the IADC Guidelines at a ESA space conference a couple of years ago, looked at whether these uh, instruments are effective. And they found the level of adherence 15 years after the introduction of the guidelines is sobering. The only exception being the clearance of payloads in GEO in the environment around Earth, especially in LEO, uh, is continuing to get more hostile every year. The goal of the mitigation guidelines to preserve the Earth environment for future generations, they found, is still beyond reach. They found that and they came to that conclusion because they found that 53% of payloads and 60% of payload mass reaching end of life in LEO are compliant. So only 53% of payloads. Um, in 71% uh, of rocket bodies reaching end of life in LEO, only 71% uh, are compliant, a fraction virtually unchanged for eight years. And then looking up at uh, GEO, that final bullet point, 66% uh, of the payloads are reaching end of life in GEO be 20, between 2007 and 2016 are compliant uh, tendency possibly rising, but possibly reaching saturation. So we need more adherence to those guidelines. Uh, you know, we can think about why the, why they're not reaching that adherence. Is it because they are merely um, non-binding or is it because, you know, states find uh, excuses for not adhering to them? Um, you know, it, it's worth investigating why they are not being followed. Uh, in addition to those IEDC guidelines in 2007, the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space developed their own more politically oriented um, and, and less technical in nature debris mitigation guidelines. You can see a list of them on the side there. Yeah, uh, uh, shorter in nature and more exhortatory, I would say. Um, you know, guideline six, limit the long-term presence of spacecraft and launch vehicle orbital stages in LEO. And, you know, um, I think the other interesting thing we have to point out about the COPUS guidelines is their application in section three, member states and IGOs should voluntarily take measures to the greatest extent feasible. They clearly state, next paragraph, they are not legally binding under international law. It is also recognized that exemptions to the implementation of individual guidelines or elements thereof may be justified by provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. I can't really think of what provisions they would be pointing to, but this is negotiated text amongst member states, uh, and and they chose to create these guidelines, but to not have them as binding. Uh, most recently, from the COPUS, we have the LTS guidelines, long-term sustainability guidelines, which have a number of provisions dealing with uh, space debris. Guideline uh, B4 perform conjunction assessment. Guideline B9. Uh, take measures to address risks associated with the uncontrolled reentry. Guideline D2, uh, investigate and consider new measures to manage the space debris population. Um, and a little bit further. However, again, status of the guidelines, the guidelines are voluntarily not legally binding under international law. This section is even longer than what's in the COPUS guidelines. Nothing in the guidelines shall con constitute a revision, qualification, or reinterpretation of those principles and norms. Nothing in the guidelines should be interpreted as giving rise to any new legal obligation for states. So they really bent over backwards to make it clear that these are nine binding and even adherence or observance of these guidelines doesn't con constitute state practice. They seem to be seem to be really, really pushing that. Uh, again, this is uh, a success in the sense that it is a uh, reflection of what member states, 95 member states of COPUS agree are the best practices. So we can point to that is the best behavior that we can uh, perform on orbit in terms of sustainability. Um, now, turning to the U.S., we have, as uh, Mr. Gerritsen pointed out, Space Policy Directive 3, also looking at space debris. And in one of the goals, they said, uh, need to update existing orbital debris mitigation guidelines and practices. And they do that. They're looking specifically at the U.S. government Orbital Debris Mitigation Standard Practices, ODMSP. And, uh, you know, even further into that document, they find that those uh, guidelines at that point, uh, or those standard practices were inadequate, directing the government to develop new standards and looking at slightly larger range of activities, large constellations, RPO, small satellites, and other classes of space operations. Let's look at all those activities in the context of space debris. And also, we should be looking at active debris removal. So I, I think this was a, a worthy uh, SPD. And, and because of that, those uh, 
you know, those ODM SPs were, those uh, debris mitigation standards were updated by the US government. Also, it calls for global engagement. You know, the US should be trying to promulgate and act as a norm entrepreneur to the rest of the world in really uh, pushing forth with these new uh, guidelines for and best behaviors for what space debris, um, how it should be treated and addressed and removed. So, um, you know, at the national level, we have, as uh, Jordan Neal pointed out, we have uh, a number of agencies which uh, do the implementation of this larger policy uh, and of international law. Uh, including the FAA regulating launch vehicles and reentry, NOAA for commercial remote sensing satellites, and of course the FCC, which has um, updated and likely continues to update its uh, debris rules. So if you're asking for frequencies, you ask the FCC. If you're a commercial actor and you're asking for frequencies, you ask the FCC. And as part of their process, you will need to be discussing your debris mitigation plans and strategies. Um, you know, in in um, in furtherance of those larger government wide goals. So I've given all that not going super deep into some of these issues because I wanted to get to this point, this these categories of these ideas of space debris. You know, you've heard me go through starting at the international level, going down to all those soft law instruments, the IADC guidelines, et cetera. You've seen that there's elements at the national level um you know where what things are we missing at this point i was trying to this is the most difficult slide the one that i spent the most time thinking about it's that you know let's see first there is prohibitions that we can place on the creation of new debris or you can phrase it a different way alternatively positive obligation to not create debris can we come up with norms that prohibit the creation of new debris either intentionally whether it's you know um, a call for prohibition on kinetic ASAT activity, which is actually uh, will be considered by the United Nations General Assembly uh, in the next few weeks, um, whether they're going to take up consideration of a, a kinetic ASAT test ban, um, or uh, intentional or negligent creation of debris, what should be the um, prohibitions or obligations placed on that? Obviously, you know from we we found that. You know, 10, 15 years of IADC guidelines and COPUS debris mitigation guidelines. We've seen that in, merely encouraging states uh, isn't getting us to the the point um, and stewardship of the space domain that we would like, uh, as uh, you know, Dr. Ja pointed out yesterday, and, and other speakers and you know other experts who look at the uh, amount and the population of space debris up there. Merely, perhaps, merely having. Um, soft law prohibitions isn't as strong as having hard law prohibitions no matter what level they exist at international or national level in fact maybe we need to have um not not soft law but something which has enforcement measures um that people can point to and model their behavior and say well we know that there's hard rules against the creation of new debris next what about rules and norms for debris which is already up there or non-functioning spacecraft, which is already up there? Do we have clear rules on removing debris um, or you know, moving it up to graveyard orbits or rules on re-entry? Have we made those you know, re-entry mandatory? Have we made end of life activities mandatory? Uh, even if we've made it mandatory, is it being observed and enforced? Um, you know, it's always a discussion whether those things need to be on the national level, uh, the contractual level, the national level, or at the highest level, the international level, uh, in the treatment of debris. Again, this is the IADC guidelines and the COPOS guidelines. Is this strong enough? Could member states of the UN take it up uh, with, uh, you know, greater forcefulness and, and actually have a, co a concrete focused agreement on some of these elements? And then lastly, uh, other people's debris, the idea of other people's debris. Is it permissible to remove space debris? Do we have salvage rights in space? Where would salvage rights exist? And I say salvage rights because earlier on I spoke about uh, Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty. States continue to have jurisdiction and control over their long space objects, whether functioning or non-functioning, whether large intact satellites that are non-functioning or whether small pieces, states still have jurisdiction uh, and de facto control over those pieces of debris. In light of that, 
do we need to work out something on the international level, whether binding or non-binding, which says that we can remove debris? Uh, pops, possibly we do. And as you know, Pete Gerritsen pointed out, there's the major division is between the large pieces and the small pieces. Um, there are possibly business cases for you know removing large pieces of debris. You contract with the with the owner and operator, you know, before it launches or while it's while it's in space, and say we have the technology to remove that piece of debris. Maybe the business case for that closes, but we don't have the business case maybe yet for um, for the small pieces of debris. And um, I you know I, I guess I would end it up at that, because, but I want to put out the idea. Um, how do we how do we have the removal of the small pieces of debris and i would invite and maybe that's one of the things we can talk about when we get to the panel can we come up with a scenario moving forward for making it you know giving regulatory clarity and certainty and predictability for uh commercial actors to go in and seize small pieces of debris whether we know the launching state possibly whether we don't know the launching state, but we're transparent about it and and grant the rights to commercial actors to remove pieces of debris. And if we if we created that regulatory framework and certainty would then, uh, you know, that commercial activity be able to develop. So, you know, with that, I, I, I'll thank everyone for your time and attention um, as I talk through some of the international and space law uh, elements. Uh, the references are at the back. And I think uh, at that point, I'll, I'll hand it over. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much. Really, really informative. Uh, in, in the background, Lee and I were texting about how uh, you, you referenced uh, Professor Ja yes, from talking yesterday, but uh, we were thinking that this would have been a really great panel for just the pair of you, given given this, uh, this topic. So uh, really, really interesting stuff here. Um, uh, first, I think I'd like to ask some context and we're gonna bring on the other panels, the panelists now, correct, Lee? Um, if you're ready to go to the panel, that's just fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're, uh, let's bring everybody on. Uh, Peter okay. Garrison, please, sir. Um, Christopher, sticking with you for a second. Um, I actually think it'd be useful to give some background on the Secure World Foundation, just as your role in all this. By the way, um, uh, shout out to whoever led the new design team and the new branding. It's a good look. So uh, it's uh, I think it's a stronger brand. So nice job on that. Um, but give us some context for the organization and why you do what you do, because you went really deep on some things. And I, I think it's worthwhile for people to know what that means. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll make it brief. We're an NGO, non-governmental organization. So that gives us, you know, and we don't have to go out and raise money for stuff. Um, but that, that gives us the leeway to not represent national governments or commercial industry, but kind of the, the rest of the world who loves and cares about space. Um, you know, and, and seeing at least if we're a small team, try and convene meetings of stakeholders and get people to share their interests and share their anxieties. You know, you if you can get the uh, small satellite community talking with the, the people who um, are gonna run observatories, the astro astronomy community, and share that they're both legitimate users of the space domain um, and both protected under space law, can you now try and work out some of your issues about light pollution and, and you know, um, at least we can hold, hold those meetings and, and leave it up to those experts to do stuff. That's that's our that's kind of our goal. Space sustainability. I, I like it. You guys make you guys y'all make sure that other people talk to each other. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't feel very agenda led. Uh, that's one thing I've really admired. Uh, I know I know you have your background at ISU. I know many of your leadership has have a background at ISU and and also Leiden University. Um, it doesn't really feel agenda led, which is really nice because there are, of course, organizations in the world that are very agenda led. So I uh, just shout out to the organization. Um, so uh, so we've talked a bit about kind of the US perspective in a pretty muddled, muddy, 
uh, jurisdictional mess that, that, that you know, because there are so many, because there are so many different organizations that have influence over what happens in space, right? There's so many. So um, one of the things I want to talk about, and, and this is, you know, a nod to, to Peter, but going back to, to Chris, um, Peter asked the question of would it be, you know, posed the idea of would it be interesting if two allied nations shared space junk and let some other actor go after, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if the UK allowed an American company to go after a piece of junk. Uh, what are your thoughts? I would actually like all three of you to ping in on that because that was actually a new idea. I hadn't considered that one before. I think there's a lot of ramifications. So e each one of you ping in on that, please. I'm, I'm gonna have you, Peter, start with it because he's the one who posed the idea. So, you know, I think the United States is in a position to show leadership by example. And I think that we want a world where states responsibly remove things that cause problems for all of us and may cause unique problems uh, you know, for, let's just say the launching state. So for instance, let's say that there was an object that very specifically caused a problem for a US constellation, maybe planet or Starlink, and that piece of debris belonged to somebody else. Well, if we have the capability and we are so motivated, you know, what a great world it would be if we were able to, uh, you know, act on our own behalf after consultation and agreement, right? So we don't want to set an example where we are, you know, just willy nilly going out and taking somebody else's stuff, but we want to, you know, create a norm where it is okay after consultation to police the neighborhood and clean up trash. And, you know, I think there are a series of precedents that could be set. You know, it's probably easiest with our closest uh, allies. Um, but on the other hand, it's probably most meaningful with the folks we get along, you know, worse with. So, you know, imagine what we might be able to do if we were able to, you know, showcase that you know, between the United States or when people talk about, for instance, US-China cooperation or US-Russia cooperation, I think this would be a great example. You know, just to say, you have a piece of debris that's a concern for us. We'd like to remove it. Um, what are your concerns, right? We don't want this to appear to be an excuse to be a spying or, you know, you know RP operation. And I think if we can show in good faith, you know, that we are doing something and, you know, work out, okay, well, who and how should liability be assumed for the deorbit or the repositioning and, and all that, I think that starts us down a, uh, a road where we want to go down. And of course, there are much broader things that we could think about. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the NSS policy paper and the space review article where we talked about sort of creating a, you know, a, a market for this where you assign specific, you know, risk and liability to individual pieces of debris and sort of create a bounty on it and an ability to, you know, sell and move those. Um, but I think, you know, a first step is just to, to show, you know, it, it's okay, we can transfer ownership of a piece of debris. And I think that also establishes something else, which is, some pieces of debris folks are going to clearly take ownership of. And some people may disagree or dispute or say, that's not mine or prove that that's mine. Uh, and, and if nobody's going to take responsibility for it, then you know, internationally we need to set some kind of norm or create some kind of protocol that basically says that that's anybody's business. You know, if it belongs to nobody, if nobody's going to claim it as, uh, you know, as as their national instrument, then it it you know, nobody is prohibited from removing. Cool, uh, George, you want to swing in on this? Yes, I very much agree. I, I like the idea of of starting small, a crawl, walk, run, uh, and having bilateral agreements, just because it's 
just not practical in my opinion right now to talk about either an amendment to the Outer Space Treaty or some huge big agreement among all the spacefaring nations. But we can start small and, and talk about, okay, here's the approach we're gonna try. We'll be open, we'll be transparent, uh, we'll be collaborative. And uh, the only tweak I'd offer for, for Peter's suggestion is instead of saying, oh, well, this satellite or this piece of junk is a problem for us, inst instead of making it a blame thing, have a more objective list. I, I've seen a list that some people have tried to put together of, of here's the, the largest mass list of objects that are apparently dead and start working our way down the list. And again, if we know uh, whose it is and they wanna say, no, 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 it's not really dead or that's mine, I'll take care of it, fine, go ahead. But if nobody claims it, or if there is a, a nation state that is willing to have that piece of debris removed, then US or other nations companies would be allowed to go ahead and go after it. So I, I think that's a reasonable approach. Great. Uh, Chris, how easy is this? Because it seems pretty hard. I mean, when people ask questions like that, I would say, you know, how, how are we going to do this very difficult thing? Very carefully. <laughs> That's the answer. Um, you know, I like the idea. I think that uh, I really like the idea. I think if we were able to have, um, we need that international transparency. And l let's be realist about this. If state A proposes it's going to do something in space that is novel and, and needed, you can rest assured that state B is going to have anxiety about it and make statements saying it's not going to be successful merely because state B is not state A. Like that's guaranteed. So take that into account, plan for it, anticipate it, predict it. And I think that, you know, if, if um, the U.S. were to say uh, and be very open about it, we're going to grant, uh, you know, license to this company um, to remove this these pieces of debris with these qualifications, you know, uh, anything in this orbit that belongs to the U.S. you can have or anything, you know, that you can capture in the next you know, five years, it is your property in space. And if you were to do this in a way that has international um, uh, international component of it, maybe the company has international uh, aspects or roots, or it's a joint, you know, joint launching state, um, and you are uh, open about it, uh, other countries are open about it, um, it sets a good precedent. We want to be norm entrepreneurs and actors and lead the way on, on how to do these